is the Happy Scientist Podcast. Each episode is designed to make you more focused, more productive, and more satisfied in the lab. You can find us online at bitesizebio.com slash happy scientist. Your hosts are Kenneth Vogt, founder of the executive coaching firm Vera Claritas, and Dr. Nick Oswald, PhD, bioscientist, and founder of Bite Size Bio. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Happy Scientist podcast. This, of course, is the place to be if you want to become a happier, healthier and more productive scientist. I'm Nick Oswald, the founder of BitesizeBio.com, and today we will be drawing on the wisdom of Mr. Kenneth Vogt, Bite Size Bio's Mr. Miyagi and the founder of the executive, executive mentoring company Vera Claritas. Today, and in all other Happy Scientist podcast episodes, you get the benefit from Ken's Yoda-like or Mr. Miyagi-like words of wisdom to help you increase your performance, enjoyment, and success in the lab. Today's episode actually has the best episode title so far of any in, a, in this, this series. It is, ah. I hate maths and organic chemistry and applied physics. Okay, Ken, what is that all about? All right. Well... I want to start start off with uh, your side of the pond says maths. My side of the pond says math, singular, no S. But <laughs> it all means the same thing for anybody who might be confused by hearing the other word. Or it's all the same for anyone who hates them. Well, there you go. You know, it's it's kind of funny. I, um, you know, I'm not a scientist, as I've said many times, but I am, I am actually uh, quite erudite when it comes to math. So you might be thinking, well, I'm going to give you a math tutorial today. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That's not what we're going to do. <laughs> um, I want to talk more about the underlying foundation of this and why people have this math anxiety. And it's funny for the, you know, the person, the average person out in the world thinks, well, you know, all you nerds are the same and you're all good at math. And of course, so many scientists are saying, well, don't let me in with that. You know, math is frightening. <laughs> You know, to my mind, and to, to use a musical analogy, math is digital, whereas biology is analog. And for anybody who's a musician out there, you know that there's a big difference between the two. And yet, they, they end up at the same place. And, you know, the argument can be made that everything is made out of math. You know, so <laughs> you're already doing math. It's been a part of the science you do for a long, long time. And you've just been telling yourself that you're not good at it. Or or other people have told you that. And it might be that somebody said you're not good at math or some group that you're part of is not good at math. Like girls are not good at math. Whoever said that, what a crazy thing. Or, you know, or, you know, or any, other, any other group. You can say they've been told over and over again they're not good at math. And... I don't know how it is was for you in school, Nick, but for me, I noticed that it became socially acceptable, even at a very young age, in, in primary school, for people to say that math is hard and it's okay to not be good at it, when no one would say that about reading, no one would say that about, about social studies or about science or about anything else. But math, you were allowed to not be good at. And... Well, all that did is foster this lack of confidence because, you know, let's face it, what are we confident about? We're confident about the things we're good at. Well, you know, how do you how do you get confident about something? Well, you go get look good at it. And often we don't start off that way. And come on, think about it. In your scientific career, did everything just come easy? Did you have to work at nothing? Were there no no rough patches? Were there no hard parts? Come on. You've, you've been doing this all along. Now, another part of the, the psychological part about, about math um, is that we don't like to look bad. And we fear we're going to look silly, we're going to look stupid if we're uh, put in a situation where we have to demonstrate our lack of math skills. <laughs> but, you know, the, we have to get past that. This The fear of looking bad, I mean, it's it's it's... It's middle school drama. You know, sometimes you got to be able to laugh at yourself. Sometimes you got to be able to say, you know what? I, I need to put in a little more effort. 
I, I, I need to try a little harder. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're going to talk about here. Yeah, and I think that uh, one of the problems with maths in particular, and actually that does apply to organic chemistry and applied physics, <laughs> is that when you look at it to begin with, it doesn't click straight away. It never will. You have to, it's not just something you grasp intuitively normally. You have to sit down and just give it some yourself some time to absorb it. So um, not like reading a book where, or, or something like that, you know, or... Um, learning a bi even learning a biological concept, most of it you can see it on the page and you can start to understand it straight away. Maths is from the beginning just looks what the hell, and then you have to overcome that and get into it. Yeah, it, it's very foundational, very fundamental, and it's it's very structured. And I think that's gonna that actually will speak to a lot of people who are scientists, knowing that there's a structure in place that you can rely on is pretty useful. Um, so that's what mathematicians have, they have striven to do over the years is to create that, those foundations. And so, you know, that's where you get things like theorems and axioms. You know, a theorem is, uh, you know, a hypothesis as it were, it's something that has to be proven, you know, and the theorems are proven, you know, and so we use the proven theorems to, um, to build more science. But the proof that it's built on is axioms. Axioms are just accepted principles that can't be proven. Now, you might look at that at the beginning and go, well, that's a crazy thing to base anything on. Like, yeah, well, guess what? Take a look at biology. Biology is axiom rich. <laughs> so we're not asking you to call on anything here that you aren't, aren't already using, aren't already doing. It's not actually that hard of a step from science to math or and I'll, I'll use the same um, idea when it comes to things like chemistry yes chemistry takes a very different look at things than biology does however it's looking at the same things so you know maybe you maybe you're looking through the front door and they're looking through the side window but they're looking at the same thing <laughs> uh, and and you know a, a chemist would probably argue it's the other way around they're looking through the front door and you're the one looking through the window um, it's all, it's all already there. So, so the first thing you got to do is take a look at theory versus reality. So you've, you've told yourself or others have told you that math is dull, you know, and well, sure. It's dull. If all you ever look at is just the raw theory of it. But if you start applying it to reality, math can get actually pretty interesting. And, and maybe you've had that experience already in your life. And like, for instance, math can be very interesting when you're investing or when you're gambling. <laughs> you start doing the math on that stuff and it starts to get kind of fun. Um, why? Because, because there's a, a practical use, there's an outcome and you get it and you like it. And the idea that, wow, we can save up enough to have a down payment for a house. All of a sudden, that math is pretty fun to do, uh, you know, because because there's an end there that is useful to you. And so, you know, this, this is something that's always cracked me up. That people, even people that don't complain about math will complain about word problems. And, and to my mind, word problems were always the place where we finally got to, to make use of this math. It wasn't just theory. It wasn't just esoteric knowledge. It was it was some practical application of this thing. And it's one of the reasons I personally got interested in application software, because you know there's fundamental software, operating system software, and stuff like that. And I watched some guys get very excited about that, but like I wanted to see where the software would be useful, where it would touch people's lives, where it would where it would accomplish something. So it, it's the same kind of thing with this. When you start to realize there's math affecting my work in the lab, for instance, um, probability and statistics. You know, statistics in the lab is very, very important. And arguably, statistics is is one of the more erudite regions of math. You know, it's it's one of the harder areas. And I know some of you out there are groaning right now. It's like, oh, I hate statistics. You know, I did. 
but think about how critical a part of your of your career they will be how they can how they can make you famous they can make you a star they they make all the difference in in a good paper you know when when somebody says here's all the data we collected but now here here are the principles we've extrapolated from that here's what we have learned from that data and to, what you learn from the data is often right there in the, in the stats so you, you got to get in there and make application of that math instead of thinking it is just of this this hard stuff that's over there on the side start seeing it as an integral part of your world and not fearing it as an integral part but like okay here's a tool a very powerful tool that i can use and you know i understand it, it's fair to be afraid of powerful tools um you know if you got something that can start a fire you got something that can blow up um you know you got something that can shoot projectiles yeah you should treat that with respect and math is kind of like that but but when you need to start fires and you need to blow things up and you need to shoot projectiles it's really useful so you know if you didn't have that tool you you'd really be you'd really be shackled you'd, you'd really be hamstrung so you know, so start to appreciate the value of the chemistry and the physics and the math as they apply to your job and your career and realize okay there you you've taken on hard things before you can take on the next hard thing another thing you can look at with this is one of the one of the things that's our our initial experience with math is what do we do we learn we learn addition tables and we learn multiplication tables and it's this bunch of memorization and that memorization for most people is boring you know some of us were uh, you know mentally built in such a way that, that wasn't boring but that's not true for most people most people found it boring and then they just then they just extrapolated that to all the rest of math well all math must be boring not so the problem solving part of math is very interesting it's it requires requires imagination it's a lot like say science <laughs> so you know when if you're going to look at it it's just oh this is just a bunch of tables i have to remember oh well, yeah well yeah who's going to want to do that and worse yeah here's a bunch of tables i'm going to forget <laughs> i'll tell you i remember organic chemistry at university was oh my god mm -hmm. you mean we just have to memorize this stuff that has no connection to each individual there's no log logic there's no pattern i mean there is eventually but to yeah. begin with you just have to remember all of these different reactions that happened and yeah that that's the sort of stuff that i didn't like but how and then later worked with organic chemists in the lab once you know the stuff then it's real you know once you go layers in you allow it to mature what they can do is amazing so yeah it's it's tools that they've learned how to use and the fact is if you've been working in the lab a while you have learned to use an impressive set of tools that you know for for a, an outsider looking in like how could anybody ever learn to use all those different things or or learn all these different techniques all that stuff they teach at bite-sized bio you know but but the fact is you do learn it and you learn it because it's useful to you so start recognizing that math is useful to you. It's going to get you places that there's there's really no other way to get to. And it's not about well, you no, know, I have to climb a mountain now. There's no road around it. And I didn't want to be a mountain climber. I just wanted to be a driver on the road. <laughs> well, you are going to climb some mountains. It's it's you know, it, I'd I'd love to tell you that life is going to be easy and it's going to be a walk in the park. But there are some hard things to do. There are some things you have to make commitments to. And you may find like, look, when I when I started down this road of you know scientific endeavor, things were coming easy to me. I got it. Things were exciting. I saw patterns that other people weren't seeing. It was just flowing for me. But when I got to math, the flow wasn't there. I was like, all right. So what do you do in a situation like that? Well, I'll bet you that, that that is also a description of part of your journey in learning science. Some parts of it flow. 
and other parts of it did not come easy at all. Well, what did you do? Well, you, here's, here's what you did if you got through it, and here's what you need to do if you haven't got through it yet. First off, get some help. <laughs> now, and the first person you can get help from is yourself. And you start that with just an attitude adjustment. If if you're all doom and gloom about it, if you're if your reaction is just nobody can learn this, it's too hard, I don't have time, I don't feel like it, this is too boring, it's it's too taxing, it's you know, and you and you just keep layering pejorative after pejorative on it. Well, how is that helping? What is that doing for you? Is it giving you an excuse? Well, now I don't have to learn math. Yeah, right. Is that going to work? <laughs> You're going to have to do this stuff. It's part of the job. And, and um, you know, here's, a, here's a, a reality of this. If it's a part of the job that just makes it, this is just a bridge too far, I can't do this. Well, then you're looking in the wrong career. Now, when I say that to you, I'm sure some of you go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. I love this career. All right, then. Well, then do what it takes and adjust your attitude. It's interesting because, I mean, the extension to this is, you know, as you mentioned statistics before, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, um, a lot of people, I'm not saying everyone, of course mm -hmm. not, but a lot of people's, um, a lot of biologists' approach to statistics are slapdash at best. And mm -hmm. I say that as someone who was like that in the lab myself, because uh, I had to, I, I got other people to, to do it for me <laughs> and that was really bad. Uh, I mean, I should have taken response. It was my responsibility to, to understand, fully understand. I mean, I had a working knowledge of the statistics that I needed to use and, and that was it. And, but as a scientist, you must know it. And there's mm -hmm. no excuse now. There's no excuse now for not, um, doing the, the spade work to, um, that's required to, to get enough of an understanding that you can be fully responsible for uh, the statistical analysis that you need to do yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no excuse, there's so much around. That's one of the, going to be the, one of the major focal points for Bite Size Bio over the next year is trying to create, is, or is putting out some great resources for, um, for uh, statistics and maths and experimental design and things like that. Because it's, a, I mean, that, is one of the the slapdash attitude to that is one of in my view anyway is one of the reasons for the reproducibility crisis and things like that that we're seeing oh yeah it's going to be career destroying for some folks because they're they're gonna they're gonna phone in some statistics and then they're going to get taken apart by by peer review and so and people are going to say they're being dishonest yeah and then it gets or or it doesn't get taken apart and they get published and then it becomes <laughs> part of the literature and so anyway it, it's really important and um the, there's a great book actually i mean there are a lot of good books about um stats um and and statistics for biology but there, there's a great book called lab math uh, lab maths or how uh, we would call them lab maths but it's a uh, lab math it's written by an american uh, her name. We've had her talk on on bite sized bio before. Um, yeah, it's published by Cold Spring Harbor Press. It's Danny something. Lab math. Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. Danny. Danny Spencer Adams. Her name is. Um, that's a great book for um, you know getting you mainlining into exactly what you said the the practical application and the practical application of mathematics um that you need to use specifically for your job so that's the fastest way into that, that sort of because the fastest way into um you know past the dry stuff and into the what you need to know and you know one one of the things we've we've mentioned application now over and over again well another another word for application is action that is, you're you're going to actually going to use it. You know, the a lot of times, if, if we're afraid of something, you know, something like math as as an example. If you're afraid of math, your fear comes before you start doing the math. It keeps you from doing it. Well, one of the ways out is to start doing it. And when you start doing it, it's not as scary because now you're seeing you you're not 
afraid of what it could be. You're seeing the problem, whatever problem you're dealing with right in front of you. So now it's specific. And as things get more specific, it's more manageable. And you can actually get passionate, as passionate about math or chemistry or physics as you are about biology. It, it's it's a pos it's possible because <laughs> look around. There are people that are passionate about those things. And I'm sure you know some scientists that are also passionate about chemistry and physics and math. And and by the way, once you get once you can start to get passionate about that, you will become more passionate about your biology because you'll feel more confident in the full gamut of knowledge that you need to do that thing rather than um that that's my experience of it. I yeah. I've worked as a biologist, you know, molecular biologist, and that you can be pretty much in the rails working in just cartoon models in a way. <laughs> um, and um, not really going into the hard side of the science. Um, but then I went to work for a company, I've mentioned this in the podcast before, where um, I was working with chemists, mm -hmm. and I was blown away by their precision of knowledge and uh, and understanding of the math and stuff like that. And so I took it upon myself to to expand my my knowledge in chemistry specifically, and what that transformed the way biology looked to me. Sure. It's definitely a thing that's worth spending the time on doing. And by the way, the way that I did it, and that was even 15 years ago, was I listened to some, I, I you know, just got some lectures that, you know, um, university lecture series from, I can't remember what university it was, but they, at that time they were publishing was a podcast and, and I just did, did the course and mm -hmm. off I went. Well, there you go. I mean, the, one of the things we can do then is get tutored, you know, and there's lots of ways to do that, as you pointed out. And, and in modern day, there's really lots of ways. I mean, there are there are YouTube channels on this and podcasts about this, and there are free university courses on this, and there are inexpensive paid courses available. And you, I mean, you can actually get a tutor or you can talk to the, the chemists in your own lab if you had a lab like where Nick was. And, you know, and get some pointers from from people that are actually doing the work on the ground. You know, you can read books. You can, you know, th there's so many possibilities. And so this this notion of, well, I, I didn't, I never got a chance to learn it before. Well, then take the chance now. You've never had more of a chance. Yeah, it really is so worth it. It's very exciting to fill in those dark areas the, the, those great areas that you kind of understand but don't really under, don't understand you know even i did two years of chemistry at university but i'd forgotten it all by the time i got to that time in the lab or mm -hmm. i'd never applied it so it never really had any life breathed into it but so i kind of thought yeah i can kind of understand what that guy's talking about you know when he's given the lab meeting but i'd never really understand and under, you don't really put, breathe life into into it until you start using it in the lab and so, or it's still till it connects up with your everyday work. And once you start doing that, it's very exciting. It's really good. Yeah. For many people, their, their best learning method is hands-on. So having taken the course or read the book, I mean, there's some stuff rattling around in their brain, but until they put their hands to it, they don't really learn it. So, and especially if that's your typical style of learning, it is imperative that you put your hands to it. And and what Nick, you just said something that was very, very key a moment ago. You may not ever get excited about the math, but you might very well get excited about the hole that it fills in the work that you do. So I don't, you know, you may not care that that you're doing statistics right now, but what I do care about is that I'm and I'm wrapping up this paper and getting the final conclusions spelled out. Okay, there's a there's a piece of this that really matters to you. Well, math is just a tool. It'll get you there. And you know, it's a lot better than trying to do it without tools. <laughs> you know, it's it's like eat, eating your porridge with your fingers. You know, it, just, just a spoon makes all the difference. <laughs> it's so easy to kid yourself that you kind of know enough as well. Really get get immersed. I mean, no, especially if it's something you've done in university. Yeah, I did those stats. I did that statistical uh, you know, learn that statistical treatment in uh, university. So I can kind of kind of know what's going on. That's fine. 
but no, nah, it's much better if you just get in there. It's like going to the gym. You know what I mean? You can go to the gym and go go once a month, or you can really get in there and do the job. Yeah, and you can go there and just putter around and exactly not really get a workout. Yeah, you, you, it'll float all boats. So yeah, definitely worth getting over that hump. I'm not sure about the applied physics, but you know, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know, it's funny. To, in in my mind, applied physics is like the the most stripped down version of math application. <laughs> so, but you know, I mean, and of course, physics doesn't affect everybody's. Um, work in the lab, but but it does have certain impacts um, on certain certain techniques that you're using, for instance. Well, you know, I mean, so. you, you do electrophoresis, very simple technique. If you understand uh, how current flows in a, in a solution, you're in a much better shape than if you just, you know, you just put it on and, uh, and leave it and hope it does the job. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was yeah, I was thinking about something completely different, and it, so I'm glad you said that because like, oh well, I never thought about that. But I was thinking about uh, using um, centrifugal force. Well, there's some there there are some basic basic physics there, and man, that's useful in the lab. Think all the things you do that involve centrifugal force. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, all right. So, the bottom line is, stop telling yourself you're not good at math. Stop telling yourself you hate math. Because you know you're just all you're doing there is is uh, you're hiding from something you know you have to do. So stop putting it off. Stop fighting it. Use the tools that are available out there. Get some help if if need be. And that you know you can get that help very privately by watching a video or listening to a podcast. <laughs> you if you're if you don't want to let any, uh, anybody else know that you have a weakness in that area, you don't have to. On the other hand, if you can get over yourself and have a little humility, you can get you can get up to speed very quickly by telling somebody that knows about it, hey, I don't understand this. Can you help me? And, and you could be over something in, in, a, in a week, in a day, in an hour. All, something you maybe have been fighting your whole life and you have, you have the key to get out. So this is, this is, this is the way out. So I hope this helped. <laughs> that known unknowns thing is that, that you talked about before. Once you start, for me, once I started looking at, uh, more into chemistry, suddenly mm -hmm. the whole connection between math, chemistry, biology, and physics started to become more and more clear. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. It's just, you, you can be, so, I mean, I, I don't know how I managed to go through my whole, you know, undergrad PhD and first couple of years postdoc so blinkered as to what science was really. Um, but anyway, that's, that's another story. <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully it's just me. <laughs> oh boy. I don't know. That, that sounds like a great episode there. <laughs> the blinkering of Dr. Oswald. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's definitely, anyway, can't say that enough. It's, it's definitely worth going outside the comfort zone and adding, um, layers of skill set on there. Yeah, we've talked about comfort zone before too. <laughs> mm, it's all connected. <laughs> it is, it is. So that's all, what I've got for today, Nick. Anything you want to add? No, I think that I, I think that I, I said most of what I would have to say in that during the, um, you know, during this, but uh, again, it's one of the things that we realize at Bite Size Bio in general that it is at least in our collective experience, you know, this is an issue. And so we're go we will be trying to, we're bringing some great people in to help us create uh, materials that will help people to easily dive into the math and or on chemistry and um, stats and stuff that will really help them to grow as a scientist. So maybe we can come back and do another uh, ep version of this episode in a year's time and we can tell the people what, uh, what resources they can specifically go to <laughs> to uh, like to do that. So. Okay, thank you, Ken. That was an interesting one. Great title. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and uh, thank you to all the people who listened in uh, as well. I hope you got something out of that. Uh, if you did, please come to facebook.com forward slash the Happy Scientist Club and tell us and join us and follow us and we can uh, interact with you there. You can tell us what you would like to hear and so on. Um, also, uh, if you're just, you, you've just reached this podcast because it's near the top of the pile on Spotify or wherever, 
and you want to dive in deeper, obviously they're all there on Spotify. But if you go on to uh, bitesizebio.com forward slash the happy scientist, you can see all episodes there and uh, get more of a, an overview of what this podcast is all about. So that just leaves me to say thank you, Ken, for another great episode. Thank you. And we'll see you again next time. Bye now. The Happy Scientist is brought to you by Bite Size Bio, your mentor in the lab. Bite Size Bio features thousands of articles and webinars contributed by hundreds of PhD scientists and scientific companies who freely offer their hard-won wisdom and solutions to the Bite Size Bio community. 